What's happening out there, fire engineering, blog, talk, radio, webcast land? <laughs> Welcome to another edition of the Mikey G and Mikey D radio show. Um, we've been coming to you live, and now we've been coming to you live and in color for the past 10 years and in color for the last, I don't know, three months or four months or whatever it is. Um, sorry if you're disappointed. Um, we have voices that are well suited for radio and faces that are sort of suited <laughs> for video. Um, gang, it's a privilege to have you along. We're very blessed to be able to do this, to represent the mighty fire engineering. And, you know, we're in the, the shadow three weeks away, away from uh, the FDIC International Epic Majestic Firefighting Show, um, which all three of the folks that you're going to see on this little webcast here are going to and going to be a part of. Um, it's gang, it's an honor to, to come into your lives for just a little bit. And from the outset of what Mike and I dreamed about when we agreed to do this radio show, our mission, our vision remains the same. Uh, we're going to bring you the best people we know, the finest people we know, the brightest people we know, the most impactful people we know in the fire service who love our calling, who dig it, who get it, but they're also getting it in such a way that they want you to get it and they want you to benefit from the knowledge that they have and the experiences that they have. And we certainly have a wonderful guest for you on tap today. And I think by the end of this, your toolbox is going to be filled up a little fuller. Your mind's going to be a little bit sharper and you're going to be able to attack this beautiful calling of ours in a much more succinct and much more impactful way. Um, riding shotgun with my, my beautiful and wonderful brother, Michael Dugan. Um, Mikey, how goes the, how goes the great world out there where you are, my friend? Very good. We're drying out nicely. We had about four or five inches of rain on Saturday. It was crazy. And um, so it's getting better. And I've had family in town for uh, my older sister's mother-in-law passed away during the pandemic and they had the service this weekend. So it's nice to catch up with family. And although funerals are sad, it's nice to see the people that are behind and celebrating. And now that we can be back celebrating in person, it's a pretty good thing. So uh, looking forward to seeing you all in person um, in a couple of weeks in Indianapolis and uh, having a great talk with uh, Jim today. And um, we'll go and talk about this uh, as we start. Yeah, Mike. Um, well, first off, I just wanted to say uh, it's been a pretty cool, pretty cool month or two. Um, you and I have been together a few times. We were at the lift conference in Louisiana with all those good folks. Um, we did the firefighter air seminar in Meridian, which was, you know, you know, again, just a back to back incredible thing. Um, just hanging out with our good friends and talking firefighter air and, um, what a privilege. I just got back from South Carolina with, uh, our, our friend Doug Klein and Candace McDonald was there and Tiger Schmittendorf and just a bunch of fun folks and, it reminds me again and again just how privileged we are to be surrounded by so many just, I don't know, I, I was sitting and listening to, to Doug and Candace and Tiger at dinner just talk about uh, the things they're doing, the dreams they have for their members, for their departments, for the organizations they work for. And gosh, it's so compelling just how much, it, it, <laughs> there's just so much incredible heart behind what all these folks are trying to do. And it just makes me, well, you know what, candidly, it makes me excited for what we're going to talk about today because our brother Jim Silvernail is is cut from that same cloth. Um, you know, I'll read the bio here because he's done a lot of stuff and he's a talented dude and he's smart and obviously he's just bloody awful handsome man. What a <laughs> what a stunning what a stunningly beautiful man. However, <laughs> uh, before I read the bio, because the bio is a little more technical, I want you to know what uh, most impacts me. Um, I, I get to talk to him on a fairly regular basis. And so every once in a while, he'll call me out of the blue or I'll call him just to check in. Um, gang, I want you to know that I never come away from those conversations feeling anything other than energized and positive. And, you know, even if we're talking about maybe at the time, tough stuff or business or whatever, um, there's a, uh, there's just a sense of purpose and a sense of um, really, truly, genuinely loving what he gets to do, you know, warts and all the fun stuff and the not so much stuff and the way he talks about his people, about his fire department, about his troops. And, you know, it's all of my friends out there uh, who are within our peer group, our circle group, the way he talks about you behind your back. And, you know, so often there can be 
I don't know, a bit of a competition or that type of stuff. And man, I just never hear anything but good stuff out of Chief Silvernell's mouth. And it's always just encouraging and refreshing to have a conversation. So, so that's, you know, that's what resonates with me. And then of course, all this stuff, you know, the, the fire chief of the Kirkwood fire department, uh, St. of St. Louis County, Missouri, um, Said the chief of uh, the Glendale Fire Department as well, brother. Is that true? That's what's yes, in the Bible. Yes, contract. Yes. Ah, okay. I didn't know. I didn't know you wore multiple hats. Yeah. So you're not only a gorgeous man, but you're a double <laughs> dipping chief. All right, I got that. Um, he's a graduate of the National Fire Academy EFO program, so he's got all all that kind of stuff, you know, that you would want. And very cool. He's the author of uh, the Suburban Fire Tactics book, which is one of the best sellers for fire engineering and, and has just such a depth of a wealth of knowledge in um, the suburban fire world, which, let's face it, it's a little bit different than more highly staffed urban or some of the density type of stuff that Mike, you and I had kind of faced. And just a compelling book, which I have a copy of on my bookshelf. And he's in the process of finishing up the non-traditional fire company which again, I assume is going to go to a little bit lower staffing type of stuff and things like that. But he'll, he'll talk about that. Uh, has written the articles, has all the education, um, serves as a technical committee member for NFPA 1710, was on the ISFSI board, um, FEMA's Urban Search and Rescue Team, Missouri Task Force One. And he was the president of the Missouri Valley Division of the IAFC in 2024. Um, Michael, what do you think? That's a pretty good resume, man. I'm most kind of embarrassed when I read my resume after reading some of the resumes of some of these rock stars. So, uh, <laughs> we got pretty be, good. Dude, huh, Michael? We got to be the guys out on Mike who? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, why are you guys, why are you guys hosting? Why isn't Jim hosting? He's got the resume. <laughs> so chief, welcome. It's good to see you, brother. It's good uh, to see you. We're going to start talking about, um, some questions to get into some meat and potatoes for our listeners, hopefully. So the first one is, what is the main theme behind the suburban fire tactics? Well, yes, but before I start, I have to pay some compliments back. <laughs> These guys have always been true legends in my book, and I'm truly honored to be here today. Uh, some of the first guys I met almost, geez, 12 years ago, if I can sell, if I can remember back that far, but uh, I've taken both her classes. Just truly an honor to be here, but I'll get into your question. Sorry, Mike. That's okay. And that is, you know, the main theme behind my book really is, uh, you know, it, it doesn't take a genius to realize that all of our playing fields are not equal. We all have different resources. We have different staffing. Um, therefore, you know, the main theme of the book is really allow circumstances to dictate action. Um, we are all up against circumstances, whether that enable us or constrain us. And we have to be realistic in the approach and understand that in order to apply or implement tactics on our fire ground. Um, and a lot of it has to do with prioritizing our, our functions and prioritizing our resources to make that work on your particular fire ground. A fire ground cannot be cookie cutter. Uh, you know, one of the worst things we can say is bread and butter because there's no such thing. Um, but it really has to be uh, tailored for your organization. And that's really where suburban fire tactics comes in. And, uh, you know, one of the main things like I guys talk about is really understanding who you are and coming together with a game plan that works for your organization. Brother, where did uh, so where did this come from? You know, you you know, there's all kinds of I've read all kinds of books on the urban environment and, you know, and all that stuff. But where where did this come from? What was the origin and, and the, the, the origin of the topic, I guess? Well, I'm going to put a plug out for our company, obviously. Uh, yeah. I was very fortunate enough as a young firefighter to get my hands on some training uh, funds and get to FDIC at a young age. Um, so I went up there with a bunch of people. We used to send tons of people, uh, changed our culture, really, uh, in our fire department. And I started seeing things and I started going to all these cla all these great classes. I took Mike's A to Z class. I've taken Champo. I've taken the Morrises. I took all these classes that just absolutely expanded, uh, you know, my thinking, my horizons. And I thought, you know, th this is great stuff I'd like to bring back. Uh, however, you got to remember that some of the phenomenal functions, and that's the way you should take it. If you want to learn how to force a door, 100%, learn it from them. If you want to throw, learn how to throw a ladder, Mike Champo is absolutely the guy to take ladders from. 
However, the implementation on our fire grounds, that's where it comes a little different. So just because of our staffing issues. So one night at the Colada, yes, I'm, I'm bringing up the Colada. Uh, <laughs> I was in the Colada and I was t- after a class, I know mm-hmm. rest, God rest his soul, right? Um, after Guinness at the Colada, I, I was talking to somebody from Mike's department and I asked, I said, hey, is there a possibility of getting my hands on ladder four? And he said, ladders four really won't work for you. You really have to. I mean, you could look at it, but you really have to understand the implementation of ladders four has to be tailored toward your abilities. And at first I was taken back a bit and I'm like, well, that's, you know, I, that's not really what I hear. But then I started maturing a little bit and understanding that he's absolutely correct. You know, that doesn't work for our organizations because we operate completely different than the FDNY. Not in our tact, not in our, you know, our objectives, but, you know, how we implement tactics. And so um, I started thinking about that. And then later on, as I matured as an officer, I got into some leadership roles and I was able to start writing SOGs. Um, and, and I started paying, I, I pay a lot of attention to fires. I don't just go to, you know, a lot of us shouldn't just go to fires and say, hey, the fire went out and uh, no one got hurt and the fire's out now. That's a ter- those are terrible benchmarks. You know, you really have to sit back and look and see what happened at fires. I like to look at fires and see what happened, what was really good, what was really bad. And I would notice things that went really bad and start thinking about, well, how can we correct that? You know, how do we how do we fix that? And really, it's in our tactical delivery. It's in our standard operating guidelines and our tactical and our standard operating guidelines at times weren't set up for our um, success. So we would go back in and we tailor those or we'd make them we create them. Um, or, or rewrite them to work for our, you know, for our characteristics and our circumstances. Um, you know, and I'm going to get into some of those circumstances here in a little bit, but um, there's a there's a real glaring one that I'm going to bring up here in a second. Uh, but I'll, I'll just hint on it, lack of truck companies. And, you know, our lack of truck companies, really, I mean, fires don't go out without truck work. I hate to tell you that. There needs to be the supplement behind the actual fire attack to make it work. Um, but anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm getting excited about all this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, tactical delivery is where it's at. And, that, and that's really where this came from, like I said. And then in about 2011, Diane talked me into writing an article. I wrote an article uh, prioritizing function and resources and writing SOGs for suburban markets. And then I got my first FDIC class in 2011. And here I am today. You know, uh, that I want you to know that that really resonates with me because I, like you, early on in my career, I went to see the brightest and the best, not just within Seattle Fire, who had a lot of really bright and incredibly talented tacticians, but I went out and I, I sought insight and classes and training from across the spectrum. And in, and in one case, the name's not important, but the it really literally one of my heroes and one of the best strategic and tactical thinkers the fire service has ever known. And we're doing a standpipe class, which was, I was very interested in because standpipes were, you know, essential to what we were doing in Seattle. And I and confess by the time we got done, um, I had to adjust my thinking very much to like what you described. It's the objectives remain the same, right? You know, the objective is ah, something's on fire up there. People are in trouble. Got to get water up there. Got to get lines up there. So we got to do that. Uh, but the what was being described as the tactical accomplishment of that was so heavily staffing centered, we could not pull it off. Not even in Seattle Fire, we couldn't pull it off. At that time, we were showing up with three on a fire truck, <laughs> you know, and 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 certainly not a hundred people in the first, you know, five minutes of the fire or ten minutes of the fire or whatever it was. So had to make an intellectual switch from the objectives are spot on. And here's what we have to accomplish. And here's some thoughts on how folks are getting it done, but having to shift, like it sounds like you're going to lead us through to objectives. Yes. How we get there is going to have to be filtered through a little bit different lens. 100%. 100%. So that leads us kind of to our next question. Um, why the suburban fire tactics and what variables differentiate between suburban from urban and rural tactics? So you know, I, I've kind of seen it before, you know, it's not a level playing field. Um, you know, really suburban, the book could really be entitled non-urban because we're taking all the, the our constraint, not re- I guess you could call them constraints compared to the urban market. 
and really kind of uh, tailor the tactics that way. But there, I, I depict three major differences in the book, and that is staffing, resources, and response area characteristics. Uh, our staffing, obviously, like Mike said, uh, we, we respond a lot with three people. Um, a lot of our engines are staffed with three. Um, a lot of our companies are staffed with three, sometimes four. And I know in rural markets, sometimes you get two or sometimes you're waiting on uh, crews to get on the scene, but uh, different. Um, and then, you know, the resources. I will tell you the biggest difference, and this is really where I started thinking a lot, and that was truck company operations. Um, we don't have true truck companies in, in where I'm at. And I find that pretty typical in suburban markets. And I know on the East Coast, you're like, holy cow, what do you mean you don't have truck companies? And Mike, I already know that you know this answer, but we don't have that out here because it's hard to justify putting two companies next to each other in engine houses, uh, just with our resources that we have coming over from City Hall and our call volumes. So therefore, you're going to have one truck out of each engine house. And even though it's got a ladder on top, it's not a truck company. Um, the only way it's a true, true truck company is if it has a little buddy next to it called the engine. And all they have to do is worry about, you know, uh, this, the non-water flowing, I guess you could say. But um, so the real challenge is, and that's going to be lead on later. Once again, I'm getting ahead of myself, is how do you how do you do how do you implement truck company operations in that world? Uh, and that's a major theme of suburban fire tactics, which will go on to my next project. But. You, you really have to understand that at three o'clock in the morning when you roll up and you're like, okay, who's going to do the truck work? That's not the time. There's got to be a game plan that, in, that takes that in fact, into effect. Um, and, and in our world, it, it's a buyer arrival order. You know, you have to look at and prioritize the resources or prioritize the functions that make the biggest impact to that fire ground and and give them the biggest oomph or the biggest uh, priority in your in your standard operating guideline and to to get them together and make it the full coordinated fire attack uh but, but like i said and then you know the response area characteristics everybody should be doing that regardless i even know in your world mike you know uh, up in new york you ha you have totally different response areas in your boroughs but um you know like for example i mean we could have rivers we could have you know mountains we could have cul cul-de-sacs Cul-de-sacs affect your tactical ability quite a bit with your laying in, your laying out, uh, you know, not blocking the front for a truck. I mean, there's there's all kind of, you know, things that need to be in, taken into consideration way, way before the fire actually happens. You know, uh, you started with you, um, you, th you thought maybe about calling it the non-urban environment. Can I just editorialize for one second here? You, you, you absolutely is it, can. Is it, sure. isn't, isn't Keith Urban a country western singer? <laughs> yeah. Keith, you Keith know what, Urban dude? That would, have been, that would have been the perfect title for the book because let's face it, truck work and firework is a rock and roll type of adventure, not a country western adventure. So <laughs> <laughs> it's the non it's the non-urban environment. It's rock and roll, baby. That's you right. Get in and get with it. So <laughs> I love it. I think it's great. Right. So, um, so we know we know that it's uh, it, it, it's different. Um, as you started to pursue this, especially with the suburban fire tactics, there's a whole breadth of things that you could talk about, and that's why we want people to take your classes. We want them to get your book. But what are a couple takeaways that you came up with as you started researching this? When you realized this is different, we got a you know same objectives. Right. Different application. What are a few that would, you know, kind of spark our listeners' interest? Oh, absolutely. So there, there's no there's no gimmicks in fire attack. Tactics put out fire. It's plain and simple. You know, I've, I've been addressed by so many different people asking, you know, are there special types of anything that can help me out on the fire ground? The answer is, yeah, you have to game plan and you have to you have to understand tactics and you have to prioritize the functions that make the biggest impact on your fire ground. And you have to you have to you have to make sure that those occur. For example, um, you know, we used to have SOGs that would call for, hey, if you're first in, pull a line. If you're second in, pull a line, pull the backup line. Well, who's doing the truck work and how effectively can you make a stretch of two people? I mean, expect you get away with it. So the problem is, is that nine out of ten times you might get away with it because you you might go on the same floor of contents, put it out, and then you're rewarding yourself for crappy tactics, and then you got a deviation um, from what is real. 
And, um, you know, so but really, if you, if you keep it consistent and build a game plan to bolster what puts fire out the hose attack line, it, it, it makes sense. So, you know, what goes back to what, what, what makes the biggest impact on our fire ground? And, that, and it goes back to the comment that no other action on the fire ground saves more lives, protects more property than the properly sized, properly timed, properly placed attack line. And then you, you, you go from there. You know, for us, two people on the hand line might work. But then what happens when you when you have all these circumstances, such as someone trapped above grade, below grade, uh, forceful entry problems, then you're, you're stuck with yourself and an officer on a hand line saying, oh, I can't make the push. Why is that? When really my second do should be coming in and assisting with what, what we're trying to do. And all the other dues coming in should be coming in and doing the truck work to you know supplement that. And really think of it as a coordinated. It's a, it's the ultimate team, team, uh, team action, firefighting, right? And all these actions have to take place together. But how do you do that? Because you're absolutely right. You you start from the objectives. Our objectives are all the same. It doesn't matter where you're at. Save lives, protect property, conserve the environment. And and then your strategies really are kind of the same too, aren't they? Rescue, locate, contain, confine, extinguish. But then it's the tactics part. That's where it's different. How do you implement the fire ground functions to achieve your strategy and your objectives? Well, I'm going to do it a hell of a lot different than, than you guys do. You know, you're in Seattle, New York. So it's got, it's got to be carefully planned out and fit your characteristics and your responses, your resources. If not, I think you're setting yourself up for a hell of a disaster. And that's really where, you know, this book tries to come in and says, hey, look. And, and that goes back to one of the bigger takeaways, too. It's not just having a game plan, but it's also having a culture that supports that. You, know, you have to have realism. I'll tell you, I'll tell you right now, I'll be the first one to, to be honest about this. The word suburban is a dirty word in our business. I don't sell out a hell of a lot of classes. I, I mean, I've got this book out there, but I'll tell you, people don't want to identify with the word suburban. They want to be, you know, they want to identify with, with, the, with the urban, which they, like I told you, if you go to hot classes, 100%, those who should be teaching the classes. But when you go back to your realism, you have to be realistic in who you are and adapt those tactics to, to your circumstances. It's that simple. I think that's great stuff. I think it really is. And um, it's true. I mean, I've always joked that the New York City Fire Department is like the Chinese Army in Korea. We just keep coming over the hill. There are more manpower. We just have people. And it's that's a great thing. But we have different tactics. We have to make sure we clear the stairways and keep people. So you've got to have the right tactics. So why don't you explain to the people who are listening to us, what is the main difference between the suburban, even though it's a bad word, the suburban and the urban implementation of these tactics? Well, like I, like I said, so we, we, we operate off what's known as a functional SOG as opposed to a positional. And that's kind of a... Um, that's kind of a, a, a theme we try, we try to capture in the book. And that is your arrival, you, your function on the fire ground is not dependent on the type of apparatus you arrive on. It's dependent on your arrival order and the need at the time of the function that needs to be implemented for the, the impact on the fire ground. And I know that's a lot, that's a very cheapy thing I just said, a lot of mouth, a lot, a lot of words, right, Mike? A lot of words. But Really, it, it, you really have to look and see what you're doing. And really, you have to, for example, if I pull up and I've got somebody trapped in a building and I'm by myself and, I, and I'm on, let's say, even a quit or an engine, what do I do? I, I just don't say, well, I'm going to go for a rescue. But then what's the fire doing? Because my second do could be five minutes out. I really have to think about what is going to make the impact to save that life. Is it going to be a VES? Is it going to be pulling a line off? Is it going to be, you know, getting, getting those functions together to make the biggest impact? Because, you know, if you get the fire put out, but once again, if there's a lot of circumstances that are, that are involved in this decision-making process, um, you know, staffing-wise, we, we always joke that uh, why do I ask people all the time, why do you do water supply the way you do? I don't know, just the way we've always done it, which is not the right answer, right? I mean, it's like you, you really want to go back. In our world, the second do always lays in. We never reverse out. And the reason because the reason for that is, is our staffing. If you pull up with a three-person engine company and you're by yourself, you have to get inside that structure as quickly as possible. You're relying on your booster tank water. You're getting in. You're pulling up for pre-connect, which is made for us. Once again, that can cause all kinds of issues. 
you're pulling off your pre-connect and the second dude's getting the water just so it allows your crew to get in there. So the, the, the answer is the reason why we're doing it is because of speed. Now, it's not what we should always be doing because there's not the, – the words always and never are horrible words in our business. Yeah. So you really have to think about why you do what you do. Um, you know, if I got a four-person company coming in, sure, I'll drop somebody off at the plug and maybe I'll connect and get water. But what's the main focus of, of what's going on? So you have to prioritize this. Um, like I said, and if you're coming in in our operation, our, our companies are pretty close. Even though we're in a suburban environment, um, we, we have companies all over the place in suburbia. Uh, maybe not in all suburban America, but in St. Louis County it is. So what we do is we rely on the first two companies to definitely make all emphasis on that first two hand line. And then the third, doesn't matter what's on top of the apparatus, they're coming in and doing truck company work. They're coming in, they're getting in that building, they're doing truck floor operations. Um, they can't really separate the company because there's only three of them. So you're, we, we really like them to go to the fire floor. Uh, to make the biggest impact for search, for searching for fire, searching for people, uh, and also, you know, trying to control the flow path. And then, uh, you know, later writing companies will, will pull a second company, we'll make them second do truck, and they'll, uh, they'll, they'll take care of what's ever left. But the problem is, is that you really have to account for all those functions. You can't just, you know, we can't split. So th there in itself is an issue too, accounting for all the functions. But, you know, you really try to prioritize what makes that in biggest impact at that time. You know, uh, Jim, would you allow me to editorialize for just a minute here? Is that okay? Yeah. Let me let me take you back to because um, uh, uh, you know Mike and I hear this continuously when we're out teaching because quite candidly, we teach quite a bit in much smaller fire departments. Um, you know, lots of fire departments that are in the suburban, the rural environments, the volunteer and the mixed, you know, paid and part paid and paid on call. The fire service is this great big stew, baby, of all kinds of configurations and all kinds of staffing. Yeah. Yes. Um, let me let me let me tell you one of my experiences real quick with with suburban fire. So you folks that are in the suburban world and the rural world, I hope you will fly your flag with pride. Um, there are certainly sexy and enticing things about working in the city. No doubt. Not diminishing that at all. And I'm glad I got to do it. But I, I also spend a great deal of time in smaller fire departments. Um, we were deployed to a wildland uh, deal, and I had just gotten on the wildland team. I was driving the lead, the lead engine at the time. I was driving the engine. Uh, we got It was brand new, too. The engine was brand spanking new. The thing was only probably a month old. And we got about an hour out of town, stopped to fuel up, and the thing wouldn't start. And nothing we could do. We couldn't get the start. The the electronic mechanism, the starter was out. You know, I'm like, oh, great. You know, we got the world's burning here in Washington and we're sitting here with a rig that won't work. And we're with uh, we're with a task force of three from the big city, Seattle, a couple from smaller departments, one from a really small department. We're all a task force and we're all having a great time and nobody cares. You know, for the most part, nobody's acting a fool. But it's the small it's the small department firefighter who has to work on their own rigs, who got down under the rig, sorted it out, figured out a way to start our rig. And the reason is simple. They don't want us touching the rigs in Seattle. We got mechanics for that and they don't want us screwing them up. As a matter of fact, if we get down under there and monkey with stuff, we can actually get in trouble. This small department where the firefighters in that department have to do everything. They had a skill set in that moment, which was needed that quite candidly we didn't have or were uncomfortable doing. That's what allowed us to get from, we just kept the rig running and we made it all the way to where we were going and had a mechanic sort out on that end, the starting thing. It just, it was a big, it made a big impression on me. Here, here's the second piece. And then you can comment. We're sitting at dinner after being up all night or at breakfast after being up all night, protecting these houses. And quite candidly, we're all out of our element. We're up there in the mountains on a long twisty road. I'm responsible for the crew because I'm driving them in. I recognize the minute we're going up that windy trail where things are on fire, we're not getting out of there fast. That I can tell we're not going to get out of this thing fast. We're sitting around the, we're sitting around the um, breakfast table and we're all tired and a little bit grouchy. Um, a, a, a crew, a very rural fire crew from up there in the mountains were sitting across from us and they were just kind of joking a little bit. And, uh, they kind of looked over and said, oh, the city, huh? You probably don't even know what a brush truck is. Now, I'm already grouchy. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I have those type of, just so you know, I try to be like this most of the time, but I actually have, Michael will attest when you, he's seen me get fired up. I have a pretty good set of repertoire response type of skills that I've cultivated. And I almost did. I almost lit in with the, you know, hayseed half breed, you know, <laughs> tell, tell, tell your wife who's probably your sister, all that nuts oh. that we do, right? Almost. And you know what? My better angels took over. And I just said, you know what, man? We are in a we are out of our element here. I said, if you wanna if you wanna know how to put out a fire in Safeco Field or you know in a high rise, we can help you out. But man, we could use any help we could get in this world we're in. And immediately, the whole tone changed. And immediately they're like, oh man, you've had a fire at Safeco Field and with the Mariners. Oh, that's incredible. And I said, guys, man, if you have time when we're done. Would you walk us around your truck, show us what's what, and give us some tips so we don't get ourselves killed out here? And for the whole rest of the deployment, this skill set that they had that we didn't have because they live in that world, they gave us some incredible watch out points to not get caught in an environment that we didn't know about. So my hope is, gang, that you will not in any way, shape, or form, I don't care what whether you have a volunteer in front of your name or a paid on call or an urban or a suburban or a rural or a double doo-wop dipsy do whatever you like for your title you're either a firefighter or you're not you're either a fire department or you're not and that's the way we should pursue it jim i'll let you comment i totally agree um whenever i i get the opportunity to lecture uh, it's, it's like first of all i start off hey look it doesn't matter if you're paid or if you are are a paid firefighter professionalism is not defined by a paycheck it's defined by your attitude, your, your, your approach to this job. And if you, I've seen some, some volunteers up on the East coast by Mike who are on the ball. Yeah. I mean, they would give some of the guys who are paid every day a run for their money. Uh, but, uh, but this is where I, I'm going to, I'm going to venture into, I've got some of the best firefighters in the world. I truly believe yeah. that are my people. I can't speak enough about them. Some of these young kids, I feel like they're my own kids. Um, I really feel that they are what they have to do for a living or for what, what they do um, for me is amazing. Um, you know, they go, we do ambulance based fire. So they can go one day on the ambulance, knowing all the ACLS drugs, all, all the critical life saving skills, and then jump onto the fire truck. Now it's not just jumping on the fire truck because now not only do you have to know the engine work, you have to know the hazmat, you also have to know the truck work and be equally good at all. they got to be a jack of all trades, um, which I, I think I'm speaking to the crowd on the majority of suburban markets, uh, or uh, even some even some urban places have to do that. I know some of them, I had a couple of friends who worked down in Houston, they did the same thing. But um, like I said, th th there's something to be said about some of the knowledge, skills, and abilities of these young firefighters. I, I You know, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't know about this next generation. Oh, that's crap. Th these next generation kids are smart. And if you can't harness that, you're not doing your job um, because they're, they're going to be taking these jobs over. I'm not going to be sitting here in 20 years. You know, somebody else is. And I just hope we did our job and that upward mobility supports a culture that, you know, it, it supports what we're trying to say every day, you know. And, that, and that's really leadership is, is supporting and, and fostering the next generation. And uh, like I said, I, I think I, I, I can't say enough about these kids coming in this job. Absolutely. I totally agree with you, Chief. And the other thing is, you know what they said about us when we came up? I don't know about those kids coming up. Yeah. Look at them, long hair. Some of them have yeah. earrings. They got tattoos. What's going on with these kids? They're a different breed. They don't want to eat uh, roast beef, mashed potatoes, and brown gravy every night for dinner. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Going to ruin the fire yeah. service, right, Mike? Ruin the fire service. Ruin yeah. the fire service. <laughs> Well, um, so let me let me take you back to a comment you made in the last little bit, Jim. Um, you you were talking about you guys. One of your tactical things was um, to get water to the fire, and because of your low staffing, typically instead of having dropping the dropping the uh, um, connection at the house and then laying out to a plug, you're going to have your initial company come in, lay a line, and get after attacking the fire. And the second rig is going to bring them water. So that is a uh, um, because of staffing and, and, and a way to do it so that, that, that everything flows well and you get water quickly on the fire, that's a tactical decision. Um, 
If I could, um, you, as you're aware, both Mike and I are very engaged in the idea of you need water to put out the fire, but you also need air. And in the fire service, we've always been pretty good about water, you know, about trying to get water. We have water systems and standpipes and sprinkler systems and fire pumps and all this stuff. We have systems for relays, right, and bringing water in. Um, my experience after a long time of talking about air is that air has never been given that same type of priority until recent times. Now, it's more and more air is getting more and more priorities. We were losing people and all the cancer stuff and et cetera. Um, your department in your state is one of the very first that has adopted Appendix L of the fire code, which is basically the appendix that in all new large structures, high rise, big box, those types of large, large structures, um, is going to adopt the air standpipe, firefighter air replenishment systems, which is a, it's the air standpipe, just like a water standpipe puts water in the street through fixed piping to distant locations, FARS puts air in the street through fixed piping to distant locations. You guys, uh, I appreciate your leadership on this, brother, you and your fire marshal. Uh, just for a minute, could you talk about the need for the air standpipe in the suburban environment and why as a leader it was important to you? Sure. So there's this misnomer that in suburban America, all we are is a bedroom community. Yeah. But really, we have some monstrous buildings. Yeah. Uh, we have, you know, we have 10-story buildings. We have five-story buildings. We've got these big box stores. You know, everybody's got a Lowe's, a Home Depot. Um, and one of the big points I try to make is, you know, please, please do not fight a commercial building like you do a residential. It is a completely different animal. It requires a totally different set of tactics, a uh, totally different set of resources. And uh, what a great example. You know, I, I said before, gimmicks don't put out fires. However, there are tools available to us that assist us in our tactical delivery. And this is one of them. If I can make a fire hit in a building and not have to retreat all the way back down to get air, and I've only got a limited amount of people there, and I can, I, and I can continuously keep up and not lose ground, what a great idea that is. And, you know, if, you, if you've never, a lot of people never fought these fires in these commercial buildings like this. They're, they're rare out here. We have them. But you have to be prepared for that. And I think these systems do that for us. You know, it, it, we, we don't have to retreat all the way back. We can keep the ground that we've held. And, you know, th th that's key, you know, especially if you're, you're working with limited staffing. Um, you know, that window, a small window to contain and control a fire is, is, can be the matter of minutes, right? And if you give it a couple minutes to grow, boom. And this system is one of those systems that's going to allow your firefighters to stay in the game and to get and then make it happen. So that's why I think it's a great thing for us. Well, and you folks are like so many small departments in the nation. You got big structures coming like crazy. You know, not not only, you know, we're not necessarily talking about 100 story high rises, but you have seven, eight, nine story mid rises coming because, well, quite candidly, and I apologize, brother. Your wonderful little community is getting lots of people that are fleeing my neck of the woods and Mike <laughs> neck of the woods because we screwed it up out here. So we're going to come show you how to make your community better. And, and also, you also are the landing zone for a lot of the big manufacturing stuff that's coming, the Teslas and the Amazon warehouses. And here's the, here's the truth about that, both for your water delivery and your air delivery. They're going to put these monstrosities in. They're going to employ thousands of people inside of them. And they are not going to give you one single additional firefighter to fight that fire when there are going to be a lot of people in trouble and needing your help. That's right. And it's very, very, very uh, interesting because a lot of these places are going into um, suburban and rural areas because these big manufacturing companies and uh, fulfillment centers and distribution centers and all that, they can, they can get the land there. So they're going into these communities where they want to put these things in, where they can find it. They can't get it into an urban area. They can't find places in the urban landscape to build these, you know, million square foot footprint, five story inside in a tilt up construction. They can't find the, the um, places to build it in the urban environment. So they're putting it in the suburban and in the rural. Yep. Yep. I think, Mike, that's a great point, you know, that our suburban fire department's ready for this, you know, is the infrastructure ready? No. And hopefully, you know, people are paying attention 
because it's coming their way. I mean, we've got a town outside St. Louis here that's um, it's in the top five in the country as far as is exploding population wise. So, I mean, if your fire department's not ready, you're going to be playing a lot of catch up and doing some very dangerous things. And your residents and your occupants are going to be asking you, the chief or the officers of that department, why weren't you ready? Absolutely. You don't get the Homer Simpson, this is my first day on the job. Nope. You know, nope. 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 Yeah, well, let me let me add one more piece and then, you know, we can go on. We only have so much time for your question. However, uh, I have heard it stated time and time again uh, when we're having these types of conversations. Well, it's like we don't have the staffing for it. We're just not going to fight the fire. We're just going to stay outside. We're not going to. Uh, I just want you to know that while there are some that are gone when you get there and you can't go into them, in the majority of these, you certainly can attack the fires. There are thousands of people working in those buildings. There are plenty of, quote unquote, non-ambulatory people with the hiring with handicap and wheelchair folks, multiple levels, long distances, quick moving fires. There are whole, gang, there are whole in the Amazon warehouses and the Tesla warehouses there are whole moving hordes of people who live in RVs that are moving during the seasonal times that are, are transient type folks that are essentially workers filling in the gaps. Are you, are you really going to tell me that firefighters in your fire department and my fire department are not going to make every effort they can to get those people out of the fire? That sounds wonderful in the boardroom. That sounds wonderful on paper. We're not just going to fight it. I know firefighters all too well, gang. I know my fire company, Jim, yours. I've met some of your folks. I certainly know many of Mike's. When people are in trouble, we're going to do everything we can to get in there and get them. Our firefighters and citizens deserve the systems in place that help us attack those fires. Chief, I'm I'm proud of you for being one of the leaders that actually saw it and is making it happen. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we definitely have an obligation. And uh, you can't shriek from that just because you consider yourself a certain demographic. Absolutely. And speaking about demographics, it really plays into our next question, because I think it, it the transition is perfect. Thank you. Um, you wrote this book, in, the book, as a captain. What do you see now in your new ro role as a fire chief in implementation of the tactical um, tactics that you want to do with this? So I think it's, it's important to state that, you know, I... I'm definitely not a seasoned uh, person. I've been in this job for probably about 28 years. I know some have been in it longer than me. Um, but it's, it's interesting to watch yourself mature as a person and as a fire officer over time. Uh, you know, I make no bones about it. When I was a kid, all I wanted to do was go to fires. I just wanted to go kill fire. <laughs> you know, I didn't care why I was there. I wanted to kill fire. And, and then eventually you start maturing, right? You start understanding why you're there, your objective. You know, it's not about the adrenaline rush. It's about... You know, you have objectives to save lives, protect property. And then all of a sudden you start putting a couple of horns on your, your collar. And then you guys are the smartest guys out there, by the way, not crossing the horns. I'm going to tell you right now. Genius <laughs> move. If I had a truck company, I could have been a truck company captain. I would never cross these horns. But I did. I accepted the responsibility. So I'm not shrieking from that. But really, it's about, you know, I went from, you know, trying to implement tactics from a company level to now I'm a chief and I really got to affect culture. You know, how you, that's really where this, where this carries. And that's kind of really why I wanted to become a chief is because I really love this industry and, and as you guys do. And there's only one way you can affect that. And that's try to affect change. Even as unpopular that is, I've made decisions as a fire chief where guys want to string me up. But as long as those decisions are made for the best interest of your people, the best interest of the community, I think that's the right answer. And I'm not trying to sell you whatever, but I'm just saying, a lot of it is culture. You know, you've got to impress a culture upon your people of, of not only just being aggressive, but also safe. You know, I demand aggressiveness from my people. But then again, if I demand that, I have an obligation to train them, to give them the resources and to show them the right way and to give them the right leaders to make them aggressive. If I don't do that, I'm not doing my job. And in 100 percent, my job is to give them the resources and, like I said, the training possible. And then I demand it. And I de and they're 100% and they deliver every day. But you see these people who jump out there. They're, I'm the most aggressive fire company in the world. And we all know how it works at FDIC or wherever. You put an A on the front, you get the first billing, or you put a number. And aggressive is a great pull into. I, I don't use that word, but I demand aggressiveness. But you can't just show up and be aggressive. 
You know, you can't put one of those T-shirts on that you buy at a conference that say, hey, if you can't stay in the heat, get out of the kitchen. That's not being aggressive, right? So, you know, I I really, truly see my role in this is to be that supportive element. As you can see, this is not as exciting as what my job used to look like, you know, being in the front right seat, greatest job (laughs) in the world. But here it is now, I'm, I'm driving the desk. But that's okay. I think as long as you know what you're doing and you have objectives, I think that's what what life is about, and and that's that's why I'm here. Unfortunately, I would have loved not to cross those horns, but it happened. <laughs> well, they're damn lucky to have you, brother. But I do want to take issue with one thing. You kind of pissed me off there a little bit. Uh oh. Um, are you trying to say that my I fight what you fear sticker doesn't make me a tough guy? Huh? <laughs> that sticker alone doesn't do it, but I know you're a tough guy, so I can make that comment. It's the kiss and everything, all the guitars yeah, behind you. Yeah, now we're talking. Yeah. yeah. Good Lord. Man, if, 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 sticker, if stickers and buttons and all this other T-shirts made us uh, uh, outstanding firefighters, man, we would be, the, yeah. we would be absolutely phenomenal. A little more to it. Um, <laughs> brother uh, – you, so obviously I have your book and have read your book and recommend your book. Um, when I when I come across not only people like like yourself that are just good human beings, um, you know, brilliant, brilliant thinkers and leaders, and you create something like your your book, which was, you know, again, a fire engineering bestseller. It's always interesting to me what comes next, you know, and I know your mind's probably always worrying and you got a pretty high bar to get over because yeah. you wrote a really wonderful you know, piece of, of training. Um, so here we go. Uh, what's next? What are you, what are you looking to do? Okay. So I, got, I know I gave you one thing, but I'm going to give you another one too. So my and I got to give a plug out to my, my main man, Jason Hovelman, who's doing the keynote Thursday yeah. morning. My, yeah. main, my, my partner in crime from the same area. Can't say enough about him, but we'll yeah. do, we do a podcast like you guys do called Tactile Impact. I think it's scheduled for the fourth Saturday of the month, but the only reason why I said that is not to promote that, but to really promote Jason. And uh, I'm so looking forward to him speaking. He's such a tremendous leader and uh, just just an all-out great guy. Okay, but the second thing is that we I've just written a book with a co-author. Uh, his name is Arthur Ashley. Many of you might have heard of him. He was a he's a newly retired truck company mm-hmm. captain out of Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, phenomenal truckie. And uh, we teamed together to write a book called The Non-Traditional Truck Company. And uh, you might say, what, what the hell does that mean, The Non-Traditional <laughs> Truck Company? We you mean you guys don't different. like tradition? You don't what? like traditions of the fire service? Yeah, totally different. <laughs> totally different. So uh, basically it addresses a lot what we've talked about. We're currently in copy edit now. We're hoping for FDIC this year, but that's okay. As long as the book gets out there, we're happy. Um, but we, we really wanted to address these issues that we were talking about today. How do you make sure that truck company operations are implemented on every fire ground consistently, regardless if you have trucks or not? Uh, this book addresses the standard operating guidelines to kind of help you, the prioritization of function, why truck company operations are so important. But also, more importantly, we wanted to address culture and mindset. You know, piece of paper is great with an SOG, but I can put out a piece of paper. is If it's not enforced or if it's not understood, it means nothing. Um, a lot of it has to do with that culture in your department. Do you embrace truck company operations? Just because you're not doing this doesn't mean the fire is not going out. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot to go that, that's involved. And, um, you know, impressing upon that upon people is super important. Um, like I said, I, I've been a student of this game for a long time. And I can tell you the majority of fires that went horrible for me were lack of truck company operations. Um, and, 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 and obviously, you know, that, that's why we're here. We save lives and protect property. You're not doing those searches right off the bat. And if you don't have that ingrained in your culture, you're not doing your job. Right. So um, just little things that we're trying to hit um, once again on that uh, functional type of system as opposed to the positional. So it doesn't really matter what you arrive on, but it's got to happen. So that's pretty cool. So as a truck company guy, I think this is really very interesting for us. But why non-traditional? What are you, uh, for our listeners, what are you talking about when you say it's non-traditional? So non-traditional, really, and we struggled. We struggled 
we're trying to come up with the right, the right, the right subject or the right title for this book. It really, because if you look at the way that other books are written, all the truck companies are really written around your tactics, East Coast or West Coast tactics, the traditional way of doing things, you know, an engine and a truck side by side and how they, they work together for the coordinated fire attack. In our world, we don't have that. So we do it in a non-traditional way, but we're still doing truck company operations. So that's kind of why we settled on the non-traditional. And we we're hoping to put enough marketing material out there to explain that. But it, it was kind of hard to say, you know, and, and Arthur's been teaching a class a long time called Truck Without a Truck. And I didn't really want to call the book that. I wanted to get a little different um, because we, we do, we, we, we capture a lot of things. Like I said, the culture, the mindset, not only the skills, the abilities and, and, and everything else that's involved. Cool. Um, <clears throat> let me, so let me just one point real quick and then I'll ask the question. Uh, you briefly mentioned your radio show with, with uh, uh, Chief Hovelman. Um, you said, oh, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to ask you to talk about it a little bit because I think it's, I think it's cool. I think it's a place people should go. Well, I don't uh, want to steal know. away from your show today. No, nah, man. No, dude, we, we want you to. We want you to. They can listen to both of them and, you know, probably they'll listen to yours and go, damn, that was way better than these two guys. I'm going to listen to that one. Um, so t talk about what you guys are doing, um, what your show's about, and just real quick. So really, it's just tactical impact. How do you make a tactical impact? And every month, what we do is we try to address, and really, it's another way, too, of trying to impress upon the importance of tactics. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're constantly saying in the magazine that we need more tactics. We need to get people to write tactics. And that's really one of the things that Jason and I are doing. We will take a, a uh, the, the last copy of Fire Engineering, find a great tactics article. We will call that individual, have them on our show to talk about what tactical impact they were referring to or, you know, what 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 tactic was involved. Um, I know we already had our little buddy Anthony Avillo on there the first show. And we talked about uh, uh, actually we talked about a, a, a article he did on laddering back in 1998, but just a phenomenal article that I wanted to capture. And, Ant and Anthony's been such a great friend. I mean, he's a good friend to all of us and he's a great fire officer, great leader, great tactician. And, um, you know, it was, a, it was an honor to have him on. But every month we have somebody from the magazine because, you know, we, we are proud of the magazine and we want to promote that. We want to promote not only the magazine, but FDIC. And that's really why we're here, you know, not only to get the information out there, but also promote this, this great thing that we're part of. Awesome. Well, I hope all of our listeners will go check that out. Um, I'm certainly excited to see my brother give his keynote. Um, what a, you know, I, I know him well, what an authentic and just character driven, purpose driven leadership kind of guy. Um, I'm really looking forward to what he has to say from the main stage at FDIC. And for those of you who haven't made your plans yet, you're a tad late in the game. However, <laughs> we'll make a seat for you, man. Get online, figure it out and come hang out with us at FDIC in about what, three weeks. Um Chief, you mentioned a couple times, I, I wrote it on my notes, you mentioned a couple times the importance of culture. And in a couple different, you know, you mentioned it in a couple different ways that we were talking about it. But let's go to culture as what, why if we're talking about tactical delivery and some of these challenges in the in the, the, the environment that is lesser staffed or that's long distance response times or thousand other things that you have to deal with. Um, why is culture so important? in that training and tactical delivery model? You know, the shared beliefs that we have really affect an entire fire department. I think we've all seen those fire departments. They're there just exist. And we have those fire departments that are there with the, uh, and I'm going to steal this from Mike, we, 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 we play to win, right? So I, I think to, to play to win, you have to have this culture of, I need to train every day. We don't go to fires every day. We have to train every day to be ready for it. Now, training isn't going to make 100% of what we do because you still you still have this factor, right? And you got the experience factor and we still try to, to build our company officers. But you have to have that, that culture of being, I want to be aggressive, but I'm not just going to be aggressive because, um, you know, I, I look badass in a t-shirt. It, it, it's aggressive because I'm here for an objective and I know my objectives. And that starts at the top. You know, everybody's got to affirm to this 
this is why we're here mentality. Um, for example, it, I, I can put all day long on an SOG, what we should be doing on fires. But if my company officers, if my battalion commanders aren't following those order, aren't following that, and my firefighters don't know what they're doing, then those are those are wasted, right? And 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 especially in a, in a non truck world that we live in, if you do not prior, if you arrive on an apparatus and you have a pump, you have water, and you have hose, what do you think you're going to be wanting to do? You're going to pull a line up when we don't need a line pulled off. You have to have this culture of I know what makes this work. And I, and I have to be ready and mentally ready all day long. And uh, like I said, it, it's ingrained. You can see fire departments who have it, some that don't. And, you know, I'm not bad mouthing those departments, but, you know, if you're going to be aggressive, be aggressive, but, but have the ability to be aggressive is what I'm trying to say. That's great stuff, chief. It's great stuff. And it also kind of leads us into our next question because what do you see as the new challenges to the suburban demographic and to the fire service in general? And especially, I think, in the suburban demographics, because as we talked about a little earlier, the growth in suburban areas, as people are, um, I mean, it kind of reminds me of the 60s and 70s, fleeing the urban areas. The suburban areas are getting, I mean, inundated with new construction, new buildings, and everything else. What do you see in the demographic, uh, the suburban, the challenges to you and to the fire service in general? I, I, I continually think the problem is having to do more with less. And you hit it right on the nose. We are going to be challenged with these new types of structures. Um, you know, it used to be, you know, the, these big commercial buildings would first pop up in our urban, you know, sister in St. Louis City. But now, they're popping up in suburbia because of the fact of the taxation and the, the availability of land. But we don't have we're not ready yet with the, um, you know, the structure in place, such as, you know, water supply or the staffing or the companies available to put those fires out. But yet we still have an obligation to do it. You know, we've swore an oath. And unfortunately, you know, when we put our lives at jeopardy because we, we do have sworn an oath and our companies are aggressive and they are going after those people. But yet. You know, as a fire chief, I have to plan it. City planners, we have to be ready for that. And we have to have the resources so they don't have to risk their lives as much to, and give them the tools necessary to be successful. Um, and you're going to see more and more of that. You're going to see more. I mean, you're seeing that with the lithium ion batteries. You know, they're throwing those out here. You know, how you put them out? We don't know. Lots of water. And, you know, it, it's funny because our, our first our box alarm now for a uh, lithium ion battery involves a record. If the, if the, if the car's in the garage, the record's going to have to pull the car out. You know, this little thing, little, little stupid things, you know, um, but technology. And also I got to tell you too, one of the biggest challenges is are these home builders that want to build these buildings as cheap as possible, but they want my firefighters to go in them. You know, they, they'll, they'll, they're, they're extremely, you know, stop, you know, they're, they're built strong, not with fire under them, though. You put a little fire under them, and it's a totally different story. And it never fails. Oh, what can I do to get around the sprinkler system? I don't want a sprinkler system in there. Why, why do you do that? I'll tell you why. Because my firemen have to go in these buildings. My firefighters have to go in these buildings, and they have to save people. We're trying to protect lives. But, yeah, I'm trying to keep them safe, too. And every one time you cut a corner, it means, you know, putting my people at jeopardy. And, and that's why we're staunch about it. You know, it's not about I'm the fire chief. Look at here. That's not, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with these people on these fire trucks that are going in these buildings. You know, they, they have to be kept safe. And that's my job. Right. Well, and, you know, uh, chief to parlay on top of that, when we raised our hand, every one of us raised our hand and took an oath. That oath was very much centered on being willing at, at any given time to put our own lives at risk so that other folks could survive a fire. And part of your fight in ensuring that there's a sprinkler system in place to try to keep the damn thing from going crazy to begin with and protect egress pathways, why we have water supply, you know, that can get water to these distant locations. Um, yes, it's about us, but also remember, we got bunking gear and we can split. <laughs> we can, turn, we can, if we go up the stairs, we can turn right back around and head back down if we have to. Right. The folks that are up there in their business suits or their pajamas, they don't have that, and we've taken an oath to go and get them. And part of that oath, I believe, also comes into play of we've got to fight the big money interest to say, 
you're not going to take away our standpipes. You're not going to you're not going to fight us on sprinkler systems because that's going to keep the thing from getting big to begin with, or at least mostly. And you're not going to you're not going to fight us off. We need air and we need water. We're going to get an air standpipe put in when we have those things. You better believe it. We can uphold our oath. <laughs> we can get in, kick butt, take names and we can go get people. So um, I, I appreciate your words, Chief. Doesn't surprise me you you have them, but I appreciate your words there. And it also it also is very important to me that we understand. And you talked about it with the city managers. You know, the city managers see bottom lines, costs, and things like that. We in the fire service have to educate the politicians and the public and have to bring them up to tell them what we're doing. And it's probably one of the, the worst jobs we do in the fire service is selling ourselves. That, you know, we're doing this, we're going in there, but now we have to leave this environment, even though you might still be in there because we have to change our bottle or we have to get, um, we don't have the manpower to fight this fire. We don't have the sprinkler that should have been helping us put this fire out. We don't have these things because you have not supported us from the get-go. And I think we have to make sure that we let those people know what we expect of them. Yeah, we, we spend 90%, if not 95% of our time being reactionary and about 5% being proactive. And, you know, the, and believe me, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an op, operations guy. I love fighting fire. But let's be honest, that's all, all reactionary. Much necessary, don't, I don't want to be told that, you know, I'm advocating against that. I'm not. But what I'm saying is we also have to put a little bit into the prevention aspects and the advocacy. We have to get out and educate not only, you know, everyone's, oh, I go to the, the, the schools and I educate the kids. No, it's much more. We got to get, also get in to get these politicians educated in, the, in these in these uh, in these home builders and why we do what we do. You know, there there's a reason why we advocate for what we do. At one point when I was on the FDMY, the union had all of the fire department, the New York City fire department doctors, who were judging members who got hurt, and they would go down and they would treat you and talk to you about getting hurt and everything else. They put them all in bunker gear and put them through fires at the fire academy to see what we went through physically. And all of the real good doctors, their awareness of what you went through opened up to like, oh my God, oh my God, this is what you guys are doing. And so, I mean, educating these people is such a big deal to everyone in the fire service, making sure they know about it. And again, we don't like to do it. We don't like to brag. Uh, well, most of us don't like to brag. There are a couple out there that like to brag. <laughs> but most of us don't like to brag. And But we have to be able to be um, keepers of what we do and pass that on to the public. Agreed. Well, brother, um, good job. I know for a fact, as people listen to this, they're going to have more questions than our little hour and 10 minutes or whatever we've got here had. So um, I also think that there's now going to be a lot of folks that are very interested in maybe bringing you out to their department, um, taking some of your excellent classes. Uh, if you want to share a little bit about those classes, you can right now. And if we've missed anything, you can, you know, you can say anything we missed. And how, how do folks get a hold of you, brother? If they want to if they want to hire the mighty chief to come <laughs> and teach in their class, uh, what, what, how do they get a hold of you to ask questions or hire you and all that stuff? Sure. So um, you can always email me, jim at suburbanfiretactics.com, or you can find me on Facebook uh, under Suburban Fire Tactics as well. Those are probably the easiest ways to get a hold of me. Um, but, uh, you know, Google me if you have to, but uh, those are the easy ways. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I offer a couple different variations of the suburban fire tactics class right now. I believe this workshop for FDIC is called suburban fire tactics, realistic tactical implementation. Um, I also, uh, sometimes I'll teach with Arthur, but I do this a lot on my own too, is adaptive suburban truck company operations, which is off, you know, the non-traditional truck stuff. But, uh, that's, uh, that's the, I do a couple different variations, but that's basically, what I do. And I, I try to stick to what I know. I don't pretend to, to know other things I don't know. So, but, uh, and I, and I, and I always, I always like to say that, Hey, I'm not an expert, but I'm just documenting the experiences that I have over time. 
I've seen stuff that works. I've seen stuff that doesn't work. I've seen stuff that's gone horribly wrong. So a lot of times we learn from our failures. But... Very cool. Well, folks, you can also get him at the email that I use at sweet Kool Aid Jim at sexyman.com. Um, he'll answer there too. So, <laughs> well, brother, um, hey, hey, great job. You know, I, to be honest, um, I wish we had three hours and just to let you rock and go into every little bit of detail. But I just want to encourage our listeners we're scratching the surface of the incredible knowledge, uh, the insight that you can get from Chief Silvernail. Um, and I want to, I also want you to know that when you bring him in, um, you're not going to be getting a lot of bluster and blow and you're not going to get a bunch of, we fight what you fear and, you know, sexy stickers with luminosity on it and all this other stuff, which, you know, it's all good. Long as whatever's be- the message behind it is good. Uh, what you're going to get is an authentic leader and somebody who's done the things he talks about. Um, and you'll get it in a respectful and thoughtful way that your people can actually implement. So both Mike and I would really encourage you to consider bringing Chief Silvernail in and talking about leadership and talking about the suburban fire environment, uh, culture, those types of things. And brother, you did a great job. I appreciate it. You're a good friend. Um, Thanks for coming on our show. Well, I appreciate it. I'm deeply honored. And I'm sorry, Mike, I didn't mean to cut you off, but this has been, you guys are both legends in my world, so. (laughs) <laughs> well, thank you, brother. And I look forward to sitting down and breaking bread with you in a couple of weeks. You got it. I look forward to it as well. Well, gang, thanks for hanging out with us. Another uh, great time on the Mikey G and Mikey D show. Um, I hope you will, in addition to watching our show, I hope you will check out Tactical Impacts by Chief Silvernail and, and Chief Hovelman. Um, we're looking forward to seeing you all at FDIC. Uh, or if not there, uh, somewhere down the road at a, at a conference or a show, maybe at your own town. Um, folks, Mike and I are always desirous that you will love what we do and that you will love it with the passion that it deserves, that you'll take care of your family, that you'll take care of each other. And it's a privilege for us to come into your world just a little bit. We're grateful for it. And God bless. And we'll catch you down the road. And hopefully we'll see you at FDIC. And if you see us, please come and say hello. Hello. <laughs>